um, about the fact that people use drugs in terms of ethnic groups to their proportion of the representation of the population. We know that, but we know that you know, our white counterparts tend to not come in contact with the criminal justice system at their proportion of the drug use that they engage in. Um, we know that a part of the prison industrial complex, which is an arm of the war on drugs, um, comes as a result primarily of the Republican strategy to recriminalize black and brown faces in order to gain political power as a result of the gains that were developed as a result of the black freedom struggle and other liberation movements that were successful in the 60s. Um, and so the, the war on drugs in many ways acts to roll back uh, many, many of those gains um, in order to evoke fear, particularly in white working class folks, um, as a way to wedge the ability to develop a coalition that would topple the elites that were able to garner power as a result of the vision of people who are poor and suffering as a result of the structure. Um, and that we see this as a recurring theme, particularly in the United States, um, in terms of the way in which the structure of raci racism um, and white supremacy is used to keep these uh, wedges in place. So I'm not going to go a bunch more into detail about the mechanics of the war on drugs and how it acts to perpetuate um, the system of domination. I want to talk really primarily about three things really quickly um, that I think need to be said that aren't said enough in conversations like this. The first is that we have to understand that those who are the targets of this war on drugs and targets of the system of global racism and white supremacy right, are folks whose humanity is oftentimes not acknowledged in our society. It is a fundamental disrespect for the humanity, a disregard for the humanity of black and brown faces in this country and around the world that allows the war on drugs, prison industrial complex, and other aspects of this war against people of color to perpetuate itself. I'll give you an example locally. Between 1999 and 2006, there were 757,000 illegal arrests, 757,000 illegal arrests by then Mayor Martin O'Malley's administration. And no one saw that as a human rights violation. If that had happened to 757,000 white people in Baltimore City, right, that would have been an outcry. That would have been seen as a human rights violation. And still today, People don't see it as a human rights violation. Now, the city has entered into a minor settlement in regards to this particular issue. But even if you were to act, a lot of people can't even conceptualize the fact that that is something that warrants some prosecution against those who are in charge of the political apparatus that justify that human rights violation. And so until we come to understand and to develop into our own understanding of this problem, the denial of the humanity, right, of understanding and seeing the fundamental humanity of black and brown people in this country and around the world, then there will not be the possibility of actually waging a successful struggle. We have to come to terms with that fundamental fact in order for us to be able to understand how to end the war on drugs. The second thing that I wanted to mention is that in many ways, we talk a lot about the problem, the war on drugs, but we don't talk enough about what some of the solutions are. And it's really important. And, and, and many of the panelists that spoke before me um, gave were our examples of what some of those solutions look like. I think what's important though, something that I think enhances the effectiveness of all these different efforts that are being waged against the war on drugs, is the fact that the money that is spent on the war on drugs, and really more money than that, needs to be put in the hands of people that are already doing the work and trying to wage this battle against the war on drugs. Many of us that do this work do this in our spare time. Many of us have other jobs that we have to do, households that we have to keep up. While those who benefit from this structure oftentimes live lavish lives where they don't have to confront these issues, but are beneficiaries of this system. And so what is, what is important is that one unified call that all of us can agree on, regardless of our ideological position, regardless of our political position, is that there needs to be more resources put in 
to undo on the damage done by the war on drugs. And until we are able to put the resources that are necessary to do that, then we are going to be in a position where we're constantly struggling in this fight instead of being able to successfully deal with the war on drugs. The last thing that I want to say, um, one of the biggest problems that I think exists with the kinds of activism that is done around issues of the war on drugs is that oftentimes what happens is that those of us who are the most acutely affected by issues like the war on drugs are oftentimes not the people in the driver's seat as to the policy changes in terms of the community organizing, in terms of the discourse around dealing with the issues around the war on drugs. And that oftentimes they can, they're, they're constrained. Many of us are constrained as a result of the fact that in order to get resources to do this work, in many, time, in many instances we're dependent on people who is not in their interest for, uh, for the war on drugs and for the general suffering of people of color and poor people in general around the world, that it's not in their interest that that is alleviated. And so one of the things that is crucial is that our communities develop a sense of economic, political, social, and cultural independence in such a way where we can chart our own destiny and create our own pathways to us being able to come up out of the structures that create the circumstances that we see today. And that we can coalesce across those cultural and political and ideological lines. One of the things that I really value about the caravan is the fact that we're able to engage collectively across cultural and, and ethnicity and, and lines of nationality in order to wage the struggle together, but from the basis of our own cultural perspective and the particularity of our situation in the different places that we occupy. That in Baltimore, we have different, a different situation, but it's affected by something that affects many other people and coalescing across those different lines is really important for us to be able to wage an effective struggle. So I hope people are actively or become actively engaged um, in the breakout sessions where we can really start to chart out what we're going to do about this problem and hope to energize ourselves and each other so that we can effectively not just end the war on drugs, because it's important, like Dominique said, like Ms. Stevenson said, that the war on drugs is an extension of the system of racism and white supremacy, from which the engine of it in, in many ways comes out of an American form of white supremacy that has been globalized, and that until we come to terms with understanding that and the actions that we take in our everyday struggle against the system, then it's going to limit our ability to be effective. So I hope that in these breakout sessions, we can have a collective understanding of the fact that it is that structure that justifies much of the exploitation that many of us experience, that justifies the war on drugs, and that we can engage in struggles every day collectively and supporting each other and able to end the war on drugs. Thank you.
it might be in organizing, it might be in creating media, it might be in talking to the public, but we all have certain skills and gifts that we've been provided with that we can use in this fight. So when she said that, what is your talent? It's about identifying what's within your spirit, what it is that you are good at, comfortable doing, that you can use to help fight this war. So consider that, and then consider that we're going to be talking about four specific issues, criminal justice, public health, community organizing, and the school to prison pipeline. And the school to prison pipeline issue is not solely here in Baltimore or the United States. You know, when they limit the access to education, they're limiting the access to possibilities. And when you have fewer possibilities as a child, you're comfortable doing what's uncomfortable because you don't know what else is out there, what your potential might be. So even in Mexico and in Canada, when education is limited, they're dictating to our children where they want them to go, what they want them to remain a part of. It's part of the cycle of poverty. So please consider those four topics. Thank you. So, Mr. Rabello, it's a pleasure. Welcome to Paul. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. It's an honor to be here. Thank you to our esteemed panel. It's a, certainly a tough act to follow. Uh, just, I wanted to make a, uh, make, make a few words. I represent the Drug Policy Alliance, uh, which works very closely with some of our esteemed colleagues on the panel to end this failed war on drugs and advocate for health-centered alternatives that can protect families and communities on both sides of the border. I'm also, and it's my honor to have been a part of this historic journey, the Caravan for Peace with Justice and Dignity, since it departed from San Diego. I wanted to make some quick connections, and, and Laura and uh, the other panelists have sort of done this of the, the other themes of the panel, the, uh, of, excuse me, of the caravan. The caravan is, is calling for, for five uh, specific policy recommendations, demands, if you will, uh, critical changes, uh, but at the center of which are prohibition, the, the failure, a recognition of the failure of drug prohibition, which has created the huge illegal markets that finance organized crime, that give them the money to buy so many assault weapons, the money that is laundered with the help of major, the big banks, and provides the excuse to the failed military militarization strategy that's only increased violence and human rights violations. Also, immigrants are increasingly falling victim to that violence, as well as being criminalized here in the United States, along with poor people, communities of color in general, and young people. So we're calling to stop the illegal smuggling of arms to Mexico. We're calling for ending money laundering and uh, accountability for the major financial institutions that are complicit in money laundering. We're calling for the suspension of military aid to the Mexican security forces and a focus for a bilateral cooperation that places human security and human rights at the center. And we're calling for protection of migrants and an end to criminalization, not just of immigrant communities, but of the black community, of the Latino community, of young people, of working with people. But above all, we are calling for the exploration of alternatives to drug prohibition. And this must include different ways to uh, decriminalizing and regulating drugs, many forms of which you've heard from our esteemed panel. If we move towards a new drug policy, one that's focused on harm reduction, on regulation, we can reduce the crime, the corruption, and the violence that we're seeing that's confronting our brothers and sisters, our neighbors in Mexico. We can also reduce and end the criminalization, the incarceration of communities here, uh, the preventable harms of overdose, preventable fatal diseases like HIV AIDS and hepatitis C that all come from the criminalization of people who use drugs. DPA, my organization, together with many other organizations, are working tirelessly to change here in the United States, which is the leading consumer of drugs, but also the leading 
exporter of failed drug policies, and we will continue to work tirelessly until we make the changes we need here at home. But I also want to assure you that we will be with you all in Mexico, in Canada, throughout the hemisphere, every step of the way, so that we can really make this a global, because it's a global problem, and we can find global solutions. I want to conclude by thanking Javier, the other family members from Mexico, for your leadership, your inspiration, your courage. Our journey, uh, this journey, has been historic, and I think beyond the five specific policy recommendations, demands. Our, our, our goal has been to touch the, the hearts of people in the U.S. And I know that we, you, have been unquestionably successful in that. I can only speak personally, but I have been touched deeply, and over this last month, I have been changed forever. And this experience, sharing this experience with you, has been a unique experience of my life. I'll never forget it, and we'll work together until we can achieve justice, dignity, and peace. Thank you so much. You know, again, I want to acknowledge the journey that these family members have made, the commitment that you've made. I'm sure some of you, when you left home, had no idea what was in store for you. So you traveled many miles, sat in many bus seats, rode over many boats, but you've also seen many faces, heard many voices. But I want you to know that at least here in Baltimore, you've touched many lives. You've inspired many people. And I'm sure, I'm sure you've done the same thing in all of the other cities that you visited. As Daniel said, his life has been changed. So hopefully, you've changed many more lives in your journey. The journey was not fruitless. It was not a waste of time, it was not a waste of energy. As I said earlier, I do not believe in coincidences. Whatever placed you on that bus was divine, and there was a reason and a purpose for it. So thank you. And I'm sure all the people that you lost, all the family members that are over there, they are thanking you also. Because we have to change what's happening so that other people don't lose their own. Thank you. So, we'll get there. We're going to join it down to the cafeteria. There's food and refreshments waiting all of us. We've been sitting for a while. I'm sure you're all a little hungry. And please take that opportunity to share your stories, to ask questions, to offer suggestions. And I'll see you on the other side of the hall. One second. One moment. Just one moment. Uh, I'm going to do something real quick here and unite two, two families. I'm going to introduce two families. Okay, I'm going to introduce my Mexican family to my Baltimore family. Mom, my sister, will you stand up? So, as we move, also into the other room. Please take a moment to greet my mother, Teresa, and my sister, Martha. She doesn't like that. But Martha, and uh, just say a few words here. Thank you very much.